Okay, today's scripture reading is 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest of us, rest of who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from, from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we... We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just lift you up and we just praise you and we thank you for everything. We ask you to be with everyone that's not doing well. Heal them, comfort them, and and ask that you hide our pastor behind your cross and speak out through him. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Trina, for picking out those songs. You know, last week, you know, we've been looking at what it is that we believe and, and back the basics, and I've been working through a number of our beliefs, and last week we looked at persecution of Christians. All who will desire to live godly in Christ will be persecuted. And I don't know about you, even when I was putting that together, you know, that that subject is kind of depressing. <laughs> you know, uh, understand that we live in hard times. And, and, and it doesn't take... Uh, uh, I, I'm not a I'm not a prophet, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that this world is diametrically opposed to the things of Christ, and things are getting uh, uh, things are going to get worse before they ever get better. In fact, I think things will not get better until Christ comes again. And here again, looking at the scriptures, I'm not a prophet here again, but it it it, it doesn't take real deep reading to understand that the time of Christ's return is drawing near. Now, when will it be? We're going to talk about this a little bit today. We don't know. It could be this afternoon. It could be later in the week. It could be next year or 10 years from now. I don't know. I I remember Billy Graham uh, once said this was back in the 70s. He thought that Christ would certainly come by the year 2000, and it's been over 50 years since he said that. Well, Billy Graham doesn't know. I certainly don't know. But we need to live in expectation. We need to live uh, as if he's coming again. And I want you to think about it a second. Christ come again, and we, we read about that. James read about it. You know, it's, he comes and he'll, he, he will call us. The dead in Christ shall rise, and we who are still alive will rise with them and meet the Lord in the air. Whether we meet the Lord in the air... Or I get broadsided by a truck on the way home. What does it matter? We're still going to meet the Lord. And we don't know when that time will come. You know, one of the... uh, and, And I love what we were singing today. Because we have so much to look forward to. You understand, this life is not all there is. We've got all eternity to look forward to. So when we talked about last week about persecution and, and uh, our life as Christians and where we're supposed to be and, 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 you know, Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. He didn't say, pick up your health, wealth, and prosperity and follow me. He said, pick up your cross. And he said, in this life, you're going to have trouble. But he also said, rejoice because I have overcome the world. One of the last words recorded by Jesus as recorded in that we have in the Bible is over in Revelation 22, verse 12. And Jesus says, Behold, 
I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. This statement alone ought to bring joy into the life of a Christian, understanding that Jesus is coming soon. But for all those who understand the implication of that statement, it will bring joy to some. It ought to strike terror in the hearts of others, if they understood, if they understood. You see, Jesus is coming to rescue his saints and to bring rewards for those who persevere. What joy! But the other side of that coin, when we look at this coin, there's two sides of the same coin. One side, Jesus is coming again. He's going to rescue his saints. But the other side of that coin is judgment. He's going to bring judgment to the earth. And that's what ought to strike fear into the hearts of the rest of the world. As we read earlier, as James read earlier, the joyful hope of meeting Jesus in the air. And, and the scripture tells us in the last part of verse 17, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, and it says, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Come that day when we meet him in the air, we will forever be with him. What a comfort that is. We look forward to that day. We sang about going to heaven, being with Jesus. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Today, we're coming to this uh, table of the Lord. We're going to partake in the Lord's Supper with one another. And, and part of the Lord's Supper is remembering what Jesus has done for us, his death on the cross, uh, that by which we have the forgiveness of sin, his resurrection, that we have the hope of life eternal. And we're going to break the bread and we're going to drink the cup. But we also remember there is a part of it that Jesus told us about. And he said in Matthew twenty six twenty nine, he says, But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We're looking forward to that, uh, to that time when we'll take it again with Jesus, with Jesus. And, and so part of the Lord's Supper is looking back, but also part of it is looking forward, is looking forward. And that's where we're looking at today. We do look forward to that day, that day when we meet Jesus in the air and forever be with him. Just as Paul had told us about Jesus returning for us, for his people, but you see, he told us about that and we read that. And, and, and today we're looking at that, uh, that, those last few verses in chapter 4 of Thessalonians, but if you got your Bibles open, where I'm going today is I'm picking it up at chapter 5, verse 1. We're continuing to read. Paul doesn't end with simply, uh, with simply Jesus coming for us and our salvation. He's also going to give us a solemn warning about judgment of the world. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians. We'll pick up where James left off. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 11. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard. Verse 1. Now as to the time in Epcot, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of the light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath 
but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are, as also are doing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we open your word today, as we study and then we go through uh, these words that Paul writes, Lord, that you might open our hearts, you might open our understanding, Lord, that you might be interpret the message through your Holy Spirit, that we might understand what you would have for us today. Speak to us. May we feel your presence. May Jesus be glorified in this place. For we pray all of this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Here's the um, emphasis of the day's message. And, and uh, when I was in the Air Force a long time ago, I, I actually took a writing course. And uh, one of the things that they did in that writing course was... Um, was uh, say when when you write out a directive, you put the punchline up front. The rest of it is explan- explanatory. So I want to give you the punchline. The punchline right up front is the last verse of chapter four and this last verse we just read of verse eleven. Let's look at them. Uh, for verse eighteen, uh, therefore comfort one another with these words. And looking down at 5.11, it says, therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. These scriptures are for our encouragement and to build us up. And, And I want you to notice that in verse 18, it says, not just simply building us up, building up one another. We encourage one another with these words that we've read. And, 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 and the word is that Jesus is coming. We need to be watching and waiting. We need to be ready. And we encourage one another to be ready. That's the message today. Let's go back to verse 1, chapter 5, verse 1. And, and, and Paul, Paul is talking. He says, now to the time in Epcot's. Some of your translations may have time and seasons. It, it's interesting, that little phrase, time and seasons. Uh, actually, that phrase is found three times in the Bible. It's found over in Daniel chapter 12, and, and we, uh, we find it over in Acts chapter 1, and we find it here. And every time we read about time and seasons, it's always about what's going to happen in the future that we have no control over. And we have no idea when that time frame is. And, and so we're talking prophecy here. And he says, as to the time and seasons, the Epcot, he says, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. Apparently, those in the church in Thessalonica has asking the question again and again. In fact, that question is, and that we find is, when is Jesus coming? When is he coming? And and this has been asked over and over again over the centuries. Even Daniel, back in the Old Testament, has asked that question. We look back in Daniel 12, verse 6, and Daniel asked the question. And understand, he's the one who wrote it all down in all these great prophecies. And Daniel didn't quite get it. And he writes, and he says in Daniel 12, 6, he says, How long will it be to the end of these wonders? In fact, he asked the question twice. The disciples also asked Jesus, Matthew 24, verse 3. And it says, as he, that is Jesus, sitting on the Mount of Olives, and this is the whole chapter 24 and 25, this is where we get what we call the Olivet Discourse. And and I preached on that a couple of years ago about what Jesus had to say about the, uh, the end of time. And it says, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Now, Daniel was told that uh, these things were to be concealed and sealed up till the time of the end. Look in chapter 12, Daniel 12, verses 4 and 9. 
Jesus told the disciples much the same thing. He said over in Matthew 24, verses 42 and 43, he says, Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would have not allowed his house to be broken into. Paul is reminding the Thessalonians very much the very same things. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, and he says, For you yourself know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. We don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know the day or the hour. That day will come quickly and it will come unexpectedly. The call is for us to be on the alert. The call is for us to be ready. And and Paul goes on to explain the day of the Lord. Day of the Lord was a terrible statement over in the Old Testament. And we go and we look at the various places where we find the day of the Lord mentioned. And it was always meant a time of judgment, judgment. And and one of such passages, I'm just going to look at one passage uh, very briefly, but we find very similar wording in many different books in the Old Testament. Look at Joel chapter 2, the little book of Joel. Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And this is just the beginning of a long dissertation here that Joel writes now. But verse 1 and 2 says, Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the, of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it to the years of many generations. Many such verses in the Old Testament. We can go to Isaiah, we can go to Micah, we can go to a lot of different Old Testament And it talks about the day of the Lord. And it's always talked about the great and terrible day. The day of dread. The day of judgment. In fact, in the New Testament, uh, we talk about the day of the Lord. And oftentimes we refer to it as uh, as the time of tribulation. When we talk about the day of the Lord, we're not talking about necessarily a literal 24 hour day, but we are talking about a period of time when God pours his wrath out upon the earth. Now, we're not going to get all into Revelation and all into the uh, eschatology, and that's the study of end times, the eschatology of all of this in the sequence of events. But we do need to understand when Christ comes, it means judgment. It means judgment. Jesus said, back to Matthew 24, Matthew 24, verse 21, he says, for then there will be a great tribulation. Such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. This is going to be the worst time on earth for all of earth's history, that great day of the Lord. And and Paul is saying the same thing that Jesus had said that day, about that day. He said that it will come like a thief in the night. It will be unexpected to the world. And they will wonder, they being the world, will wonder what happened. First Thessalonians 5, 3. While they are saying peace and safety. In other words, all is going right. Yeah, boy, things are hunky-dory. We like the way things are going. Things are going fine. In fact, Jesus talked about, you know, and the same thing in the days of Noah. You know, they were uh, they were marrying and giving in marriage until the day of the flood, and God should close the door of the ark, you know, until that time of judgment. They're saying peace and safety. Then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. Now, Labor pains, it's, uh, uh, I don't need uh, 
uh, be lecturing to especially you women about labor pains because I don't have no concept. But it's not like they're unexpected. But the problem is, and, and what is meant here and where the author and where Paul is getting to is, is the fact that when they come, there's no escape. It's going to happen until it comes to fruition. And what does he say here? Like uh, labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. Now, I want us to look at this verse here. And, and, and what's important in this verse is some of the pronouns being used here. It says, they are saying peace and safety. Upon them, upon them, destruction will come. And, and they will not escape. He, he's using they and them. He's talking about the unbelievers of the world. He's talking about all those in the rest of the world that do not belong to Jesus. He is talking about them. When that day comes, it will be too late. There's no getting saved after that point. When Jesus comes, it's too late. They won't know what hit them, basically. In fact, over in Revelation, we, we, we read words like they, they go to the mountains and just beg for the rocks to fall down and cover them up. And, and, and it's too late. Then we get into verse 4 and 5, and the pronoun changes. And he focuses on believers. Look at look at verses 4 and 5, and he says, But you, but you, he's talking to the Christians now. He's talking to the believers. He's talking to the church. He says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. We live in the day. We are part of the day. We, we live in the light. We see what's happening around us. We are not like the rest of the world that are in darkness and can't see these things coming. You know, Jesus tells us, you know, watch for the signs, you know. And we, we see the sky changes colors. We, we know that a storm is coming. He says, watch for the signs. Watch for the signs. We know when the time is getting closer. The rest of the world is oblivious to this. We live in the light. And and Paul tells the Romans, over in the Romans, he says, light is our armor. Romans um, 13, verses 12, uh, 12 and 13, he says, the night is almost gone, the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of the darkness and put on the armor of light. Paul likes uh, talking about armor. We'll talk about more of that in a moment. He says, let us behave properly as in the day and not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. Think about this. Where do all the carousing and drunkenness and sexual promiscuity, where did it happen? It happens at night. It happens in the darkness. Why? Because people don't want to be seen. Or what they are doing. First Thessalonians five verse six, and he goes on to say, "So, so then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober." Sleep here. Uh, sleep has uh, various meanings in the scriptures. Earlier, uh, what James read, he says, talking about those that have slept in Christ. That talks about those that have died. Oftentimes, sleep, when talking about Christians, deal with those that have died in Christ. Now, sleep in this context means those that are spiritually insensitive. They're not aware of what's going on around. Uh, they're, they're insensitive. They do not see the world with a biblical perspective. Preached on that a year ago about biblical worldview, how we need to view the world as God views the world. But, but, but we are on the alert. Yes, we need to listen to the news. We are aware of what's going on in the world around us. And we evaluate those happenings with spiritual discernment. We don't let social media interpret the events of the world for us. Because when we see what's happening around us, we, we do it with the Bible in one hand and, uh, and the Spirit of God leading us in the other hand. We go with spiritual discernment with what's happening in the world. You see, the world is asleep. They have no spiritual sensitivity to the moral decline and debauchery that is happening all around us. (laughs) 
You know, it doesn't take a deep look in the newspaper or watching the evening news to know, and pardon my French, to know that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. I don't know how, any other way to put it, but we don't have to go along with it. We look at the world with spiritual discernment, discernment. First Thessalonians 5, 7. For those who sleep, do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. The world lives in darkness. Why is that? This is a verse I used a couple weeks ago. John 3, 19. This is the judgment that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. You know, you don't have to tell people their deeds are evil. People know that. That's why it's done at night. They don't want to be uncovered. And understand one reason why Christians are, are, are persecuted, Christians are not liked uh, and, 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 and are turned away in the world is we represent the light. We, re- we reflect the right of Christ. We don't necessarily have to go in and point out and say, you're doing wrong, you're doing wrong, you're doing wrong. Oftentimes, the fact that we represent what is holy, just being present will intimidate people with holiness. And the way they deal with that is they turn us away, they put us down, uh, they do something to cover the light. They don't want to be seen. No. Uh, More times than not, just simply a godly presence will, uh, will turn people off because they don't want to be seen. They don't want to be seen. Paul goes on to say in verse 8, 1 Thessalonians 5 eight, he says, But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. We put on the armor of God. Go read Ephesians uh, uh, chapter 6, verse 10 through the end there, talking about the armor of God. And Paul gives a nice dissertation there. But, but he, 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 he loves that analogy. We, we are to wear the three distinguishing characteristics of a true Christian, a true Christ follower. Faith, love, and hope. Our faith is shown in our dependence upon Almighty God. Our love is shown for in the love of the Lord and our love for one another. We talked about that in the past. The, the, how, how will the world know that we are... Jesus' disciples, by the way we love one another. We're talking about within the church here. The way we love one another. And our hope is in the fruition of our salvation. And that is the return that Jesus brings. When he comes, our, our salvation will be, will be complete and we will be with him forever. Jesus' return will complete our salvation in a very physical sense. But, but the thing that I want us to look at here is that our salvation mentioned here in this passage is more than just in the life eternal, but it's also salvation from the great and terrible day of the Lord. Remember where we're reading, you know, judgment is coming. And let's go on further in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 and 10. And it says, for God has not destined us for wrath. God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. So that whether we are awake or asleep, awake or asleep, meaning whether we are alive or we have died in Christ, we will live together with him. And as we read earlier, we will be with him forever. You see, God has not destined us for wrath. Wrath is coming to the earth. But you see, the wrath being referred to here is the judgment coming on the earth. And Jesus did not die so that we would endure his wrath. He died for us so that we might be forgiven. He took the wrath of God upon himself that we might escape all of this. Now, I'm not getting into the, like I said, the, the different particulars here. People talk about the rapture, and that's where we talk about being taken up with the Lord. And, and as we are taken up and we're forever with the Lord, we will be saved from His wrath. 
At what point that occurs, I'm not going there today. There's a lot of discussion. A lot of you know how I feel on some of these things, but, but, uh, uh, but that's for another time. But understand, he has not destined us for wrath. The wrath is coming to the earth. And so our salvation is two parts here. One, we are saved from the wrath that is coming, but we're also saved for life eternal with him. So there's two uh, two perspectives to this. And whether we're alive or we sleep in Christ, we will be with him for eternity. John 3, verse 36 says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son. Interesting words here, obey. He who does not obey the Son will not see life, But the wrath of God abides on him. The wrath of God abides on him. The point Paul is making here is for us to look forward to our hope of salvation. We need to look forward to Jesus' return. That's going to be a great day. That is going to be our great day, especially as things get worse and persecution increase. We're looking forward to when Christ comes and will rescue from us from all of this. We don't know the hour or the day, but we are looking forward with our eyes wide open. We live in expectation. We live always ready and, and, and doing his will until that day. We're not going to worry about whether we're going to be alive when that day comes or not. As I mentioned earlier, he can call us home this afternoon, you know. God does not guarantee us our next heartbeat. What will he find us doing when that time comes, whether it's our last heartbeat or he chooses to come this very day? What will he find us doing? We need to live every moment in in expectations of his return. 1 John 2, verse 28, we read, Now, little children, abide in him. Live in him, if you will. Abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. I I do believe there's going to be some believers, there's going to be some Christians that are... Uh, that are saved. They're going to be with Jesus for all eternity. But uh, uh, at that time that God either calls them home or, uh, or, or Jesus returns, they're going to be found in compromising positions. And they're going to say, oh, they're going to, they're going to face Jesus in shame. Uh, I, I pray that doesn't happen. But we are called to live in the light We are called to live expectantly. We are called to live as if we expect Jesus to come any time. And it's with these instructions, Paul concludes by telling us in verse 11, he says, Therefore, therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing, just as you are doing. Are you ready for Jesus to return? It, 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 it matters little whether we're alive or we're uh, passed away. Uh, when he calls you home for that event, are you ready? Are you doing his will? Uh, it, it's exciting to know that Jesus is going to come for me. It's exciting to know that I will be with him for eternity. But how will he find me when he comes? Do we live expectantly? How will Jesus find you when he comes and calls? This morning as we prepare for the Lord's Supper, and and Jesus, uh, or Paul tells us over in 1 Corinthians 11, you know, that we're not to take this in an unworthy matter, that we need to prepare our hearts and our minds. We need to be thinking about these things. We, we need not to have any unconfessed sins as, as we come and we prepare to uh, remember what Jesus has done for us. We're going to be singing a hymn here in a moment, uh, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. 
this is your time to prepare. This is your time to pray. This is also a time of invitation. Uh, and, 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 and this is our time that we might be ready to come together and to take the supper of our Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, move among us today. Lord, touch us. May we, may we realize that your coming will be unexpected. Lord, the world won't know what happened. But Lord, because we have been adequately warned, may we live in expectation. May we live as if he will call us at any time to join him in the air. Lord, there may be someone here today that has never truly trusted Jesus, that doesn't know whether they have that eternal security with him or not. Lord, whether they're here, whether they're listening to us online, Lord, I ask that you draw them. Your spirit will draw them to yourself. And Lord, that, that, that they may come to a true saving, saving knowledge of Jesus, that they may come to know him personally, not just about Jesus, but to know him personally and intimately. Touch us today as we prepare to come together. And Lord, as we come to take this Lord's Supper with one another and remember what you have done for us. May Jesus be glorified, for it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.